Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to talk about whether or not fingerprints can be altered or disguised. Are there things that can be done in order to make the fingerprints harder to lift or harder to leave or harder to interpret, harder to analyze, harder to investigate? Can we disguise our fingerprints or are these prints for sure 100% set in stone, can't be altered, can't be disguised? Let's figure out this question. So we need to start this whole idea of altering or disguising our fingerprints in the early 1900s with John Dillinger because as soon as fingerprints were discovered as a, a means of identifying a person in the early 1900s, criminals and individuals breaking the law obviously tried to avoid being caught and being identified and so they began really quickly after identifying the fact that there are ways to identify a person by leaving fingerprints at the crime scene these criminals tried to devise ways to alter or to hide their fingerprints john dillinger in the 1930s put acid on his fingertips to try to change the appearance of his fingerprints he tried to basically burn them off um, which was a technique that hadn't been proven however he um, made observations of individuals working in pineapple fields um, prior to the discovery of fingerprint analysis he noticed and observed that these individuals that were working with pineapples didn't have fingerprints or had very faint fingerprints um, didn't readily have visible fingerprints and so you know one of the kind of um, hypotheses or um, theories that he theorized was that pineapples are very acidic maybe the act of constant washing or constant bathing um, these individuals fingerprints with the acid juice of the pineapples wore them off um, it could have been a combination of the things um, or a combination of things it could have been the acidic juice from the pineapple in addition to the very rough texture of the pineapples were enough to kind of wear off the upper levels of skin or the outer layers of skin. Um, but chemical substances that are found in the pineapple plant when combined with the pressure of handling the plants dissolve the worker's fingertip skin. That is known to be true. Individuals working in pineapple fields at the time did have very noticeable um, removal of, of fingertip skin, which as you can guess, removed the fingertips. Um, but as you remember from um, our first lecture of this particular set of videos, that the fingertips actually form not in the outermost layer of skin, they actually form in our most interior layer of skin. And so even if you are a pineapple worker and even if you are bathing your fingertip skin in acid and even though the, the fingertip skin may be worn off and your fingerprints therefore fainted or, or become more faint, um, fingerprints always grow back even if you do something to alter or disguise them. And so when fingerprints were taken from Dillinger's body in the morgue, once he was um, pronounced deceased, they actually were able to make matches, 100% definitive matches of his fingerprints then to known prints left at crime scenes that he was known to have committed. Um, and so even though he did basically his best attempts to destroy his own fingerprints, um, they were actually able to um, post-mortem match them back to to known prints taken at the crime scene okay so even though you 100 percent can in the moment alter fingerprints they will always grow back and they will always be um, matchable to known fingerprints um, before obviously the the attempts to uh, ruin them <clears throat> and actually sometimes the scars formed by trying to remove the fingerprints makes them even more um, easily identifiable just because scars are um, unique to an individual, scars are individual evidence because you are, are probably the only person on the planet in addition to the fingerprints that you're trying to remove. 
that have the scars that you gave yourself in trying to remove the fingerprints. So how reliable is fingerprinting as a means of identification? We just in our last video talked about how to print a tin card. Um, this image shows um, a tin card being printed. Obviously the fingerprint examiner would be the one that is actually making the prints. The perpetrator or the individual that is being printed um, are, are being inked or the fingers are being inked and then they are being placed on the tin card appropriately. But how reliable is fingerprinting? Some fingerprint experts um, authenticate that fingerprinting and fingerprint identification is almost flawless, meaning 100% um, of fingerprint matches are able to be definitive. However, a study in 1995 tested 156 fingerprint um, examiners, and they determined that 20% of those 156 were actually successful in making one or at least one false identification, 20% fail rate is actually not great um, and is not really reliable at all. However, um, if you look at the other side, 80% of those 156 examiners were um, successful in not making any mistakes. Um, and so it has an 80% reliability, but it does have a 20% kind of margin of error, which isn't great. Um, since fingerprint ev evidence is individual evidence, it is vital that the incredibly high standard of performance be always maintained to ensure proper convictions are made. That is important because a lot of times when we are analyzing fingerprints, the fingerprints, because of the fact that they are individual, meaning you are 100% tying those fingerprints to a person, and... 100% tying those fingerprints to a crime scene, it is vital that no mistakes are made. If this is a murder scene or if this is a murder case and a particular person is being tied to a murder um, based on their fingerprints and those fingerprints were analyzed incorrectly, you are indirectly or incorrectly tying that person to the crime scene for murder, which can put them in prison for the rest of their life when in fact they, they weren't there. So, how are fingerprints analyzed? Obviously, the tin cards that would be pr printed are analyzed. Um, we have kind of gone away from um, printing tin cards with ink, and now we are printing tin cards with scanners, which is making it a lot easier to analyze these. Um, by 1987, the FBI had 23 million criminal fingerprint cards on file, and getting comparison with a fingerprint found at a crime scene and one stored on a file required manual searching of all of those 23 million fingerprints and it could take as long as three months to do a really thorough search by hand now because we have digital scanners and digital databases like APHIS um, which came online in 1999 which provides digital automated fingerprint searches the latent print searches and electronic storage of fingerprint photo files it makes them a lot easier to search because the database is searching or operational 24 hours a day, 365. Before, when people were manually searching fingerprints or trying to manually analyze fingerprints, they were only able to do it during the workday when they were actually on duty. Now, um, fingerprint analysis can take place even when the technician is off. Um, which speeds up the process a lot. So the FBI Next Generation Identification Program, which is NGI, which we'll talk about in class, is enhancing the APHIS by adding physical characteristics such as facial scans of known and suspected terrorists to the system. They are also putting in tattoos and other um, identify, identification marks. Today, local, state, and federal agencies submit fingerprints to APHIS where fingerprints can be quickly and efficiently searched. And in most instances, a fingerprint examiner scans the fingerprints once APHIS makes a match so that we can actually kind of double check our database and double check our system with actual human, um, human skills, if you will. He or she or the technician inputs the information into APHIS, which identifies any possible candidates often within two hours. Once that preliminary match has been made by APHIS, a fingerprint examiner will analyze all candidates identified by APHIS because APHIS is only going to give you possible matches. It is up to the examiner to make the actual like definitive match based on the possible matches that APHIS gives us. 
Um, once the print has been identified as being consistent with a suspect, the examiner must obtain a copy of the original fingerprint record for the final confirmation and verification. All of these are little individual minutia marks, which will help the database and APHIS kind of look through really quickly or search through really quickly all of the digital scans. That's one of the ways that the APHIS system works is that um, once these individual minutia markings and angles are mapped, the computer can really easily kind of trace through all of the known um, prints that are put into the system in order to get possible matches for the individual to look at. So instead of the um, fingerprint analysis or the fingerprint examiner looking through all 23 million fingerprints for known matches or for any matches for that matter, the computer can search through all of the millions of fingerprints, pare it down to just a few that now the, the fingerprint examiner has to look through to verify and to kind of make the final decision. Since a person initially identified the print pattern, it is essential that the fingerprint be re-examined for accuracy. Again, we need to double check and verify that the fingerprint is in fact 100% match so that we aren't falsely convicting somebody and so that the evidence holds up in the court of law and so that it is not refuted by a defense attorney. Okay, how are latent fingerprints collected? We've had previous videos on this as well. Remember, latent fingerprints are the fingerprints that are um, obviously uh, not visible or not readily visible to the naked eye. Dusting the surfaces such as drinking glasses, faucets on sinks, telephones, or any other smooth surface with a fine carbon powder can make the fingerprints more visible. We've done that in class. Once you apply the powder which makes the fingerprint visible. You then need to secure tape over the top of the fingerprint so that it preserves the fingerprint. You will then lift that tape off of the surface, which will transfer the print from the surface to the tape. You then need to place the tape on an evidence card and um, place the date, time, location, and collector. Basically all of that chain of custody information proper evidence collection techniques involving photographing the fingerprints before they are lifted. All of those things need to be maintained all the time um, in order for the fingerprint to be preserved and to be added to APHIS or at least searched through APHIS in order to possibly make a match. Bring your questions to class. See ya.